Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to Seoul Global Study Group. I'm Lane Hartzell with Ha Jun Chang of Cambridge University. Good afternoon. How are you? Hi. Pleasure to be uh, talking to you. And also today I have Miguel Ballins with us. He is from B2B Foundation. Uh, I want to let me start out, uh, Hajun, with a, a specific question I had at the top of the list, and that's the economic crisis. Um, can we just talk about that a little bit? And specifically, right now, Europe is right on the crest of you know, maybe breaking up, maybe not. We're not quite sure. And what, what's the newest information there? Well, I think, uh, I mean, uh, I don't think there's any question about the European Union itself are breaking up, but I, I, I think uh, a lot of people are beginning to accept that the Euro currency zone is not going to be... So, the, the last yeah, thing I was, have, yeah, the way they set up the European Union... Mm. Yeah, so the, when they, they set up the currency union, they hadn't really prepared uh, the foundation very well because, that, you know, think about uh, the United States uh, is another continental-sized economy with very diverse uh, economic structure. So parts of Mississippi could be I mean, the first, a third world uh, place. Uh, the parts of you know, California and the Northeast uh, are as advanced as any place in the world, but it uh, still works as a single economic unit with a single currency because it uh, has a lot of fiscal transfers. So some of this, this rough calculation and figured out that uh, if uh, income falls by a dollar in one of the 50 American states, the transfer from the federal government will make sure that about 50 cents of uh, that is uh, made up. In contrast, in the case of Europe, uh, that transfer amounts to only about five cents for one dollar. So uh, there's uh, this uh, huge uh, fiscal gap. And also, the United States has an integrated labor market. So if uh, jobs disappear in, I don't know, Michigan, people can move to uh, New Mexico. But in the European case, of course, uh, legally, uh, people are free to move. But I mean, uh, how many Greek workers do you know who got a job in Germany? You know, the, the, the language barriers and cultural barriers. So we stopped uh, these things. And on top of that, they set up the central bank, uh, the European Central Bank, which uh, acts as a central bank only when it likes to. You, know, <laughs> you cannot have that. So, I mean, that, people know these problems, but in the end, that, uh, the issue is uh, the political because unless the Germans start accepting that they should treat uh, the Greeks and the Spaniards as they would treat other Germans, there will be no solution to this. Uh, so uh, while there's a recognition that, uh, for this uh, further integration, if you like, I think that uh, it's uh, going to take time because uh, you know, this kind of political solidarity cannot be built overnight and institutional changes also take time. The question is whether the Eurozone can survive uh, that period. And I mean, that's why I'm guessing that uh, there might be exit by you know, at least uh, Greece and one or two other countries in the process. Now, the biggest danger is that, uh, that if uh, the Germans want to exit, you know, the Germans might at one point say, well, we are not uh, paying for this anymore and uh, you can all go to hell. So if that happens, uh, things will become really ugly. So we are really standing at a crossroads. Mm -hmm. Arjun, I have a, an additional question about the same topic. Um, mm. So it seems to me that there is a consistent effort uh, to you know, undermine the, the, the welfare state in Europe, to yep. uh, bring back pension levels, uh, mm -hmm. to end free education, yep. uh, free health care. You see it happening everywhere. Um, That's right. At the same time, it seems to me that if you destroy so radically the income and the consumption of of people, that this is not good for the system as a whole either. So, I, so I'm, I'm a bit puzzled by the logic of the ruling elites in Europe. That you know, what are they exactly trying to achieve? Well, uh, they are very short-sighted because, as you said, I mean, uh, you keep 
putting pressure on people's living standard, uh, consumption will fall because even if they have a certain amount of income, if uh, you destroy the welfare state, they lose the sense of uh, security and uh, they start uh, kind of saving more stock uh, spending that will uh, put the downward pressure on the economy. Also, the, the rewriting the social contract, if you like, in this kind of uh, backhanded way, will create uh, more social conflict, which is uh, not good for the rich people either. So the, this is a very short-sighted uh, move. But unfortunately, the, many people in the European ruling elite uh, see this as a good chance to roll back the welfare state, which uh, they think have, uh, has become too big. And uh, the uh, population is uh, less uh, able to resist this uh, than before because uh, of the decline of the trade union movement and you know, fragmentation of uh, social classes. But I think that uh, Europe's, uh, the, uh, Europe uh, has a huge uh, that, uh, problem uh, ahead because, you know, I mean, I'm in favor of a stronger, not weaker welfare state, but uh, even if uh, someone is uh, in favor of a weaker welfare state, I mean, uh, you cannot rewrite a uh, social contract in this kind of way. I mean, you have to have a proper negotiation. You cannot yeah, say that we are going to take away your entitlement because we don't have money. You know, I mean, that, <laughs> that, that, that means that you don't see it as an entitlement. So that we, we have a, a huge uh, the crisis uh, the mm -hmm. coming our way. Yeah. So how, how do you see the, the future of East Asia in the context of these troubles in Europe and the United States. Do you, do you think East Asia can maintain this kind of growth that, it, that it's on? Uh, 